So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy, you need very advanced techniques for electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host and thus as human beings are made up of lots of different cell types and we are interested in understanding at the molecular level, how that virus infects the liver and why does it infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart or it doesn't infect other tissues. So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy, you need very advanced techniques for electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host and thus as human beings are made up of lots of different cell types and we are interested in understanding at the molecular level, how that virus infects the liver and why does it infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart or it doesn't infect other tissues. Finally, we take a look at how to mix an unmixed liquid at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together just as easily as it brought them together, it can also separate them out again. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative which involves using high-energy centrifuges. Finally, we take a look at how to mix an unmixed liquid at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together just as easily as it brought them together, it can also separate them out again. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative which involves using high energy centrifuges. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students.
It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. Rebuilding carbon-rich agricultural soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Rebuilding carbon-rich agricultural soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. One of the things that people have said about agriculture is that on the whole it is more labor intensive than hunting and gathering. And that's one of the reasons why people have looked to explanations which, you might say are kind of coercive factors that people have been forced into agriculture because they had no alternative. That is ultimately what may happen. But at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting, that it was actually a social need. I mean, how much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect and recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods. One of the things that people have said about agriculture is that on the whole it is more labor intensive than hunting and gathering. And that's one of the reasons why people have looked to explanations which, you might say are kind of coercive factors that people have been forced into agriculture because they had no alternative. That is ultimately what may happen. But at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting, that it was actually a social need. I mean. How much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect and recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods.
Higher interest rates have knocked investors' confidence in putting their money into property, evidence suggests. The insurance company Standard Life says that the rate rises since last summer have led more people to question the wisdom of property investment. Higher interest rates have knocked investors' confidence in putting their money into property, evidence suggests. The insurance company Standard Life says that the rate rises since last summer have led more people to question the wisdom of property investment. So, what we are going to talk about this evening is impacted by a big asteroid. There's tons of stuff on the Earth each day, about 100 times. Most of its fine dust is tiny, tiny particles. But what we are going to mainly concern this evening is bigger stuff. The bigger stuff is probably originally from an asteroid. There are millions of asteroids. There is the formation of the planets, probably because Jupiter's gravity prevented a planet from forming. So, what we are going to talk about this evening is impacted by a big asteroid. There's tons of stuff on the Earth each day, about 100 times. Most of its fine dust is tiny, tiny particles. But what we are going to mainly concern this evening is bigger stuff. The bigger stuff is probably originally from an asteroid. There are millions of asteroids. There is the formation of the planets, probably because Jupiter's gravity prevented a planet from forming. If sea levels continue to rise, eventually the property becomes inundated and the real value of the property, the vast bulk of its value will be in the value of the land which of course is then unusable. And that's of course not insured by property insurance. So at that point a lot of waterfront landowners and banks and other financial institutions that have lent money against the value of those properties are going to find that they suffer very serious losses and it's not at all obvious at the moment who would compensate them. If sea levels continue to rise, eventually the property becomes inundated and the real value of the property, the vast bulk of its value will be in the value of the land which of course is then unusable. And that's of course not insured by property insurance. So at that point a lot of waterfront landowners and banks and other financial institutions that have lent money against the value of those properties are going to find that they suffer very serious losses and it's not at all obvious at the moment who would compensate them. The Mississippi River built this area, each year it would flood, it would bring in a lot of nutrients and a lot of sediment, and the sediment would settle over the marsh, and over time that sediment gets compacted. Imagine if you dig a hole in your yard and you put, and you have the pile of dirt next to it, and a week later that pile is going to be smaller because the dirt compacts. Well the same thing when the delta was built by the Mississippi, the delta itself compacts over time and under a natural hydrology the river would bring sediments back out to those areas and deposit sediments on top of areas that are subsiding. 
and so we actually build land with an active delta. The Mississippi River built this area. Each year it would flood, it would bring in a lot of nutrients and a lot of sediment, and the sediment would settle over the marsh, and over time that sediment gets compacted. Imagine if you dig a hole in your yard and you put, and you have the pile of dirt next to it, and a week later that pile is going to be smaller because the dirt compacts. Well the same thing when the delta was built by the Mississippi, the delta itself compacts over time and under a natural hydrology the river would bring sediments back out to those areas and deposit sediments on top of areas that are subsiding. And so we actually build land with an active delta. I'm going to focus on the concept of judgment that something is key to academic freedom. The university is in a position to sort of manufacture people's minds. It is clear that judgment is something that is naturally instilled in people in the normal course of events. And let me just start by pointing out something about how rare the concept of judgment is these days. I'm going to focus on the concept of judgment, that something is key to academic freedom. The university is in a position to sort of manufacture people's minds. It is clear that judgment is something that is naturally instilled in people in the normal course of events. And let me just start by pointing out something about how rare the concept of judgment is these days. Thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly. Thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels and digital technology. And they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads?
Our guests today will help answer that. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels and digital technology. And they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. During the past week, NPR has been reporting on the growing income gap in America. Economists say one big reason for the widening divide is the steady loss of manufacturing jobs. As more and more U.S. companies move factory jobs overseas, people who lack skills and education have trouble making a decent living. When the carrier air conditioning company shut down its Syracuse, New York plant in 2004, 1,200 jobs were lost. The current financial state of the laid-off workers depends on their skills, age, and degree of determination. During the past week, NPR has been reporting on the growing income gap in America. Economists say one big reason for the widening divide is the steady loss of manufacturing jobs. As more and more U.S. companies move factory jobs overseas, people who lack skills and education have trouble making a decent living. When the carrier air conditioning company shut down its Syracuse, New York plant in 2004, 1,200 jobs were lost. The current financial state of the laid-off workers depends on their skills, age, and degree of determination. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator, CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator, CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking.
To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library is situated on the Euston Road next to some pipe crustacean press, in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs. Oz and look to your left for attention. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570 and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of parliament but he is mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Throughout this tour we will see his legacy. To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library is situated on the Euston Road next to some pipe crustacean press, in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs. Oz and look to your left for attention. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570 and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of parliament but he is mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Throughout this tour we will see his legacy. Certainly I do think that by the end of this decade, the largest social institution in Australia will be single-person households, so that the family, mum, dad and the kids, is receiving in terms of market share. So less than 28% of households are now mum, dad and the kids, whereas by the end of the decade you'll see that 29% of households are single-person households. Now the issue with single-person households is that people are looking for companionship and as a consequence people living singly will include increasingly pets as their companions. So you could see in Australia, in the next decade, where the fur family, the pet family, actually becomes the dominant social institution in Australia, rather than the human family. Certainly I do think that by the end of this decade, the largest social institution in Australia will be single-person households, so that the family, mum, dad and the kids, is receiving in terms of market share. So less than 28% of households are now mum, dad and the kids, whereas by the end of the decade you'll see that 29% of households are single-person households. Now the issue with single-person households is that people are looking for companionship and as a consequence people living singly will include increasingly pets as their companions. So you could see in Australia, in the next decade, where the fur family, the pet family, actually becomes the dominant social institution in Australia, rather than the human family. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are very difficult to answer. Unless you start integrating computing and visualizations. So really I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address, unless you start reconstructing.
Start modeling and visualizing past landscapes, objects and movement of people. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are very difficult to answer. Unless you start integrating computing and visualizations. So really I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address, unless you start reconstructing. Start modeling and visualizing past landscapes, objects and movement of people. It is about a hundred years since that great Canadian-born physician Sir William Osler, Regis Professor of Medicine in Oxford, complained about the increasing influence of the pharmaceutical industry on the medical professions. If he knew how this influence had increased since then, he would be turning in his grave at the way the industry now dominates doctors. Prescribing habits. It does this not only by direct and indirect pressure on the doctors themselves, but also by encouraging the public to ask for scripts and to demand that governments provide the money. It is about a hundred years since that great Canadian-born physician Sir William Osler, Regis Professor of Medicine in Oxford, complained about the increasing influence of the pharmaceutical industry on the medical professions. If he knew how this influence had increased since then, he would be turning in his grave at the way the industry now dominates doctors. Prescribing habits. It does this not only by direct and indirect pressure on the doctors themselves, but also by encouraging the public to ask for scripts and to demand that governments provide the money. So every year influenza does strike. It causes seasonal flu outbreaks and that's caused by new influenza strains. It affects about 5 to 20 percent of U.S. residents, and 200,000 people become sick each year, and 36,000 people die from flu. And sometimes flu viruses can actually mutate to form novel viruses. We worry about novel influences subtypes, because they can cause pandemics, and a pandemic is a global outbreak of a disease. The most severe influence of pandemic in the last century occurred in 1980. And it was caused by a flu virus called H1N1. It began in the United States around September 14, and within five weeks, and it spread throughout the entire United States. It's estimated that 20 to 100 million people died worldwide from that year and it included 500,000 Americans. So every year influenza does strike. It causes seasonal flu outbreaks and that's caused by new influenza strains. It affects about 5 to 20 percent of U.S. residents, and 200,000 people become sick each year, and 36,000 people die from flu. And sometimes flu viruses can actually mutate to form novel viruses. We worry about novel influences subtypes, because they can cause pandemics, and a pandemic is a global outbreak of a disease. The most severe influence of pandemic in the last century occurred in 1980. 
and it was caused by a flu virus called H1N1. It began in the United States around September 14, and within five weeks, and it spread throughout the entire United States. It's estimated that 20 to 100 million people died worldwide from that year and it included 500,000 Americans. Winteringham only does one thing, we provide housing and aged care services to older homeless men and women. Along the way we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won, and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honour. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture, that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private veranda which allows them to socialise outdoors, and also creates some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Winteringham only does one thing, we provide housing and aged care services to older homeless men and women. Along the way we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won, and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honour. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture, that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private veranda which allows them to socialise outdoors, and also creates some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. The question that most people want to ask at this point is, how do we speed up the transition? If it's a good idea to have fewer people in the world, which may or may not be the case, then how might we move towards a situation in which population growth rates are reduced? How might we speed up the transition, the demographic transition that I've talked about? And I think there are probably four kinds of answers. I'm not going to suggest that all the kinds of answers, but those are the most obvious ones. The question that most people want to ask at this point is, how do we speed up the transition? If it's a good idea to have fewer people in the world, which may or may not be the case, then how might we move towards a situation in which population growth rates are reduced? How might we speed up the transition, the demographic transition that I've talked about? And I think there are probably four kinds of answers. I'm not going to suggest that all the kinds of answers, but those are the most obvious ones. Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. First, we need them to solve the current crisis. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods where they are jobless. But the government has to stand to the side and let new entrepreneurial firms challenge companies that can no longer compete. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us to frontiers of innovation.
Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. First, we need them to solve the current crisis. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods where they are jobless. But the government has to stand to the side and let new entrepreneurial firms challenge companies that can no longer compete. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us different tiers of innovation. Experimental psychological research is conducted in a lab under controlled conditions, and attempts to rely solely on an application of research methods to understand behavior and mental processes. As an example of a psychological experiment, you might want to investigate people's perception of different tones. Specifically, you could ask the following question, is it easier for people to discriminate one pair of tones from another depending on their frequency? To answer this, you would want to disprove the hypothesis that all tones are easy to discriminate. Experimental psychological research is conducted in a lab under controlled conditions, and attempts to rely solely on an application of research methods to understand behavior and mental processes. As an example of a psychological experiment, you might want to investigate people's perception of different tones. Specifically, you could ask the following question, is it easier for people to discriminate one pair of tones from another depending on their frequency? To answer this, you would want to disprove the hypothesis that all tones are easy to discriminate. Let's move on to our four major tips on how to answer the tell me about yourself interview question. Okay, so let's start off with tip number one. Tip number one is to give a snapshot of your work history. So what this means is, you're going to go back in time to the earliest professional job that you've ever held, and you're going to start your story from there. So you're essentially going to describe what company you worked at, what the title was that you held when you were in that position, how long you stayed in that position for, and, most importantly, what were your major responsibilities in that position. Let's move on to our four major tips on how to answer the tell me about yourself interview question. Okay, so let's start off with tip number one. Tip number one is to give a snapshot of your work history. So what this means is, you're going to go back in time to the earliest professional job that you've ever held, and you're going to start your story from there. So you're essentially going to describe what company you worked at, what the title was that you held when you were in that position how long you stayed in that position for, and, most importantly, what were your major responsibilities in that position. Financial markets swung wildly in frenzied trading marked by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. Trading in US and European credit markets was exceptionally heavy for a third consecutive day. London trading was marked by particularly wild swings in the prices of credit derivatives, used to insure investors against corporate defaults.
financial markets swung wildly in frenzied trading marked by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. Trading in US and European credit markets was exceptionally heavy for a third consecutive day. London trading was marked by particularly wild swings in the prices of credit derivatives, used to insure investors against corporate defaults. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard. His works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard. His works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. Signs that secured borrowing remains robust and firm data on manufacturing and retail sales, released on Thursday, painted the picture of an economy that has yet to be cooled by the recent spate of interest rate rises. Signs that secured borrowing remains robust and firm data on manufacturing and retail sales, released on Thursday, painted the picture of an economy that has yet to be cooled by the recent spate of interest rate rises. Lawrence Stephen Lowe was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowe is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes people with human figures often referred to as matchstick men. He painted mysterious and populated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death. Lawrence Stephen Lowe was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowe is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes people with human figures often referred to as matchstick men. He painted mysterious and populated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death.
Daniel Harris, a scholar of consumption and style, has observed that until photography finally supplanted illustration as the primary means of advertising clothing in the 1950s, glamour inhered less in the face of the drawing, which was by necessity schematic and generalized than in the sketcher's attitude, posture, and gestures, especially in the strangely dainty positions of the hands. Glamour once resided so emphatically in the stunts of the model that the faces in the illustrations cannot really be said to have expressions at all, but tangles or tilts. The chin raised upwards in a haughty look, the eyes lowered in an attitude of introspection. The head cocked at an inquisitive or coquettish angle, or the profile presented in sharp outline, emanating power the severity like an emperor's bust embossed on a Roman coin. Daniel Harris, a scholar of consumption and style, has observed that until photography finally supplanted illustration as the primary means of advertising clothing in the 1950s, glamour inhered less in the face of the drawing, which was by necessity schematic and generalized than in the sketcher's attitude, posture, and gestures, especially in the strangely dainty positions of the hands. Glamour once resided so emphatically in the stunts of the model that the faces in the illustrations cannot really be said to have expressions at all, but tangles or tilts. The chin raised upwards in a haughty look, the eyes lowered in an attitude of introspection. The head cocked at an inquisitive or coquettish angle, or the profile presented in sharp outline, emanating power the severity like an emperor's bust embossed on a Roman coin. Fungi are an important part of any forest or woodland ecosystem. They are the major agents by which twigs and leaves are broken down, releasing nutrients for reabsorption by plants. And we know fungi also form a constructive partnership with living trees. David Robinson from the Open University's Life Sciences Department explains that although we have known about this partnership and relationship for some time, we are now learning more about the nature of that relationship. Fungi are an important part of any forest or woodland ecosystem. They are the major agents by which twigs and leaves are broken down, releasing nutrients for reabsorption by plants. And we know fungi also form a constructive partnership with living trees. David Robinson from the Open University's Life Sciences Department explains that although we have known about this partnership and relationship for some time, we are now learning more about the nature of that relationship. Well in 2004 we integrated ticketing in Southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel access all the three modes in Southeast Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value, so to put value on the card, and then to use the card for traveling around the system. Well in 2004 we integrated ticketing in Southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel access all the three modes in Southeast Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value, 
so to put value on the card, and then to use the card for traveling around the system. Social harm originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations cause that nation states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology, so there are a group of writers who think that. And I would include myself there that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. Social harm originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations cause that nation states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology, so there are a group of writers who think that. And I would include myself there that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. His thesis is that the grammar of human social life is emoted. What makes up our basic social patterns in, you know, around the world? Emotion. Showing interest or getting angry or being embarrassed or blushing, or showing a kai, a coy, flirtatious smile. Those are the basic units, like the alphabet, of our social patterns around the world. Really great stuff. Important to our field, not experimental, no systematic controls, right? Just a basic, rich description of how we behave in the most important context. His thesis is that the grammar of human social life is emoted. What makes up our basic social patterns in, you know, around the world? Emotion. Showing interest or getting angry or being embarrassed or blushing, or showing a kai, a coy, flirtatious smile. Those are the basic units, like the alphabet, of our social patterns around the world. Really great stuff. Important to our field, not experimental, no systematic controls, right? Just a basic, rich description of how we behave in the most important context. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. 
It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. What is nanotechnology? A report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identified two topics. Nanotions is the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those that larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design characterization, production and application of structures, devices and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. I will talk a little in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being around 100 nanometers or less. What is nanotechnology? A report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identified two topics. Nanotions is the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those that larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design characterization, production and application of structures, devices and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. I will talk a little in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being around 100 nanometers or less. Numbers and diagrams are highly abstract and condensed summaries of the world. They require a degree of mental effort to bridge the gap between them and the aspects of the real world they stand for. Approach them slowly and with care, allowing yourself time to get the feel of what you are looking at. Don't assume you already know what you are looking at. It's easy to be distracted by the surface appearance of a diagram but we are really interested in the underlying message. Numbers and diagrams are highly abstract and condensed summaries of the world. They require a degree of mental effort to bridge the gap between them and the aspects of the real world they stand for. Approach them slowly and with care, allowing yourself time to get the feel of what you are looking at. Don't assume you already know what you are looking at. It's easy to be distracted by the surface appearance of a diagram. 
but we are really interested in the underlying message. My name is Posey D and I now work in sports marketing and branding events and team management. We work with big brands, I work with a shoe company, and we work with a team of young people across Europe, who are all professional surfers, snowboarders, dunksers. And we send them on trips, we organize adverts, we organize magazine shoots, and try and create an image around the shoe brand. I've come from quite an unconventional background. I was a professional snowboarder myself for three or four years, full time, so I'm not used to sitting in an office, I'm not used to going to work every day. And still I've only been doing this job for a year, and sometimes I'm like oh god, have to go to work, again, that's ridiculous. But it's always different, so it's fine. And some weeks it's quite quiet, other weeks it's totally full on and really challenging. My name is Posey D and I now work in sports marketing and branding events and team management. We work with big brands, I work with a shoe company, and we work with a team of young people across Europe, who are all professional surfers, snowboarders, dunksers. And we send them on trips, we organize adverts, we organize magazine shoots, and try and create an image around the shoe brand. I've come from quite an unconventional background. I was a professional snowboarder myself for three or four years, full time, so I'm not used to sitting in an office, I'm not used to going to work every day. And still I've only been doing this job for a year, and sometimes I'm like oh god, have to go to work, again, that's ridiculous. But it's always different, so it's fine. And some weeks it's quite quiet, other weeks it's totally full on and really challenging. UK has an aging population as a result of decline in birth fertility rate and mortality rate. This has led to a declining proportion of the population age under 60 and an increasing proportion age 65 and over. In every year since 1901, with the exception of 1976, there have been more births and deaths, and the population has grown due to natural change. Until the mid 1990s, this natural increase was the main driver of population growth. UK has an aging population as a result of decline in birth fertility rate and mortality rate. This has led to a declining proportion of the population age under 60 and an increasing proportion age 65 and over. In every year since 1901, with the exception of 1976, there have been more births and deaths, and the population has grown due to natural change. Until the mid 1990s, this natural increase was the main driver of population growth. Noise is often thought to be something bad. It's an unpleasant disturbance, or sonic irritant. We might associate it with a neighbor's late night, party, or a persistent car alarm. It's a term that might even be used to stigmatize certain groups of people. But there's much more to noise than what greets the ears, and what's in sound.
Though it often goes unnoticed, noise is a key part of our mediated lives. In the 1940s, the American mathematician Claude Shannon proposed that noise is necessary for the transmission of information, since the medium, the means by which information is transmitted, is always noisy. Noise is often thought to be something bad. It's an unpleasant disturbance or sonic irritant. We might associate it with a neighbor's late night party or a persistent car alarm. It's a term that might even be used to stigmatize certain groups of people. But there's much more to noise than what greets the ears and what's in sound. Though it often goes unnoticed, noise is a key part of our mediated lives. In the 1940s, the American mathematician Claude Shannon proposed that noise is necessary for the transmission of information, since the medium, the means by which information is transmitted, is always noisy. Well, of course. The fact that the hands look so similar was intentional. The scriptorium wanted a professional-looking work and they didn't want a lot of individuality in the script. So, the primary objective of the original's writing in this manuscript was to make it look identical. As a matter of fact, because scribes are different people and they have different hand-eye coordination and different habits, they ended up producing something that was slightly different which is not easy to tell to someone who hasn't been staring at the manuscript for a while. Well, of course, the fact that the hands look so similar was intentional. The scriptorium wanted a professional-looking work and they didn't want a lot of individuality in the script. So, the primary objective of the original's writing in this manuscript was to make it look identical. As a matter of fact, because scribes are different people and they have different hand-eye coordination and different habits, they ended up producing something that was slightly different which is not easy to tell to someone who hasn't been staring at the manuscript for a while. I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science, it is about making science accessible to as wide an audience as possible. It's about encouraging young people to think about science as a career. It's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public. And it's not just about a one-way flow of information. It very much is about a dialogue. I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science. It is about making science accessible to as wide an audience as possible. It's about encouraging young people to think about science as a career. It's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public. And it's not just about a one-way flow of information. It very much is about a dialogue.
This year marks the 400th anniversary of the first permanent English settlement in America. A group of Englishmen, including John Smith, who later was befriended by Pocahontas, built a fort at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, 13 years before the Pilgrims crossed the Atlantic on the Mayflower. And for the past 14 years, Bill Kelso has been working to uncover the secrets of Jamestown. This year marks the 400th anniversary of the first permanent English settlement in America. A group of Englishmen, including John Smith, who later was befriended by Pocahontas, built a fort at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, 13 years before the Pilgrims crossed the Atlantic on the Mayflower. And for the past 14 years, Bill Kelso has been working to uncover the secrets of Jamestown. I have to be honest with you, saying one of my favorite aspects of being a researcher is being able to travel and go to conferences. And I know that sounds superfluous because you're not working, but actually you are working and you're networking. And and that I and I've told my graduate students and my postdocs is the key to success as an individual scientist, but also as a community. We have to be able to network and share things because this is a competitive field. And you can maybe be repeating something that's already been done, and nobody reported that it didn't work because they don't want negative findings. So I think that in that context, I think one of the most fulfilling things to me is to be able to travel to other universities, institutes, not only to describe my work, but more importantly, what are they doing and what techniques do they have that we can apply at our institute? I have to be honest with you, saying one of my favorite aspects of being a researcher is being able to travel and go to conferences. And I know that sounds superfluous because you're not working, but actually you are working and you're networking. And, and that I've, and I've told my graduate students and my postdocs is the key to success as an individual scientist, but also as a community. We have to be able to network and share things because this is a competitive field. And you can maybe be repeating something that's already been done, and nobody reported that it didn't work because they don't want negative findings. So I think that in that context, I think one of the most fulfilling things to me is to be able to travel to other universities, institutes, not only to describe my work, but more importantly, what are they doing and what techniques do they have that we can apply at our institute? Yes. I mean if we look at 5 in the world's past history, when did we see a 5 degree temperature change? You have to go right back into the last ice age, so the sort of temperature difference we are talking about in the future, of course going up, is similar to the temperature difference between a warm period and a typical ice age. So what this means is that the world's climate system will change radically. If you just take one country, India, India is totally dependent on the monsoon. If the monsoon fails one year that means, the word failure implies less than 10% of average rainfall, then they have massive crop failure. If the monsoon 10% exceeds the average they have massive flooding, so they're critically dependent on that monsoon. Now nobody believes that a temperature rise of 3-4-5 degrees isn't going to have an enormous impact on that monsoon.
Yes. I mean if we look at 5 in the world's past history, when did we see a 5 degree temperature change? You have to go right back into the last ice age, so the sort of temperature difference we are talking about in the future, of course going up, is similar to the temperature difference between a warm period and a typical ice age. So what this means is that the world's climate system will change radically. If you just take one country, India, India is totally dependent on the monsoon. If the monsoon fails one year that means, the word failure implies less than 10% of average rainfall, then they have massive crop failure. If the monsoon 10% exceeds the average they have massive flooding, so they are critically dependent on that monsoon. Now nobody believes that a temperature rise of 3-4-5 degrees isn't going to have an enormous impact on that monsoon. Now we come right out of the woods. Transpiration is the passive process by which water moves from the wetness of the soil up a plant and into the air via the leaves. We've known about it for years and you probably haven't thought about it since school. The assumption is that transpiration works by a wick effect, where the negative pressure of the water in the leaves draws up water from the roots but until now it has been impossible to replicate this process in the lab. Abraham Struck and Tobias Wheeler from Cornell University in New York have constructed a fake plastic tree which emulates the natural process. I spoke to Abraham Struck and started by asking why synthetic transpiration has been such a tall order. Now we come right out of the woods. Transpiration is the passive process by which water moves from the wetness of the soil up a plant and into the air via the leaves. We've known about it for years and you probably haven't thought about it since school. The assumption is that transpiration works by a wick effect, where the negative pressure of the water in the leaves draws up water from the roots but until now it has been impossible to replicate this process in the lab. Abraham Struck and Tobias Wheeler from Cornell University in New York have constructed a fake plastic tree which emulates the natural process. I spoke to Abraham Struck and started by asking why synthetic transpiration has been such a tall order. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucia, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucia, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. Perhaps you've seen pictures of the large array of, you know, those radio telescopes in New Mexico, scanning the skies for intelligent life in the movie Contact. Well radiant astronomers have caused to celebrate the first phase of a giant new radio telescope array went operational in Northern California. It's going to help astronomers study things like black holes and dark galaxies. All the while scanning the stars for, who knows, radio signals coming from somewhere else in the universe. Maybe ET is phoning home.
Perhaps you've seen pictures of the large array of, you know, those radio telescopes in New Mexico, scanning the skies for intelligent life in the movie Contact. Well radiant astronomers have caused to celebrate the first phase of a giant new radio telescope array went operational in Northern California. It's going to help astronomers study things like black holes and dark galaxies. All the while scanning the stars for, who knows, radio signals coming from somewhere else in the universe. Maybe E.T. is phoning home. Now because you're having all these cities, and all these factories people are going to move to these cities for work, and you're going to have a lot of different people from different areas in one particular small geographic location. So you're going to be seeing these people interact a lot more than you would in small rural areas. Also, you're going to have housing shortages, crime, lack of jobs, so there's a lot of things that you could observe and test and see. And this is what sociology really takes off as a science. Now because you're having all these cities, and all these factories people are going to move to these cities for work, and you're going to have a lot of different people from different areas in one particular small geographic location. So you're going to be seeing these people interact a lot more than you would in small rural areas. Also, you're going to have housing shortages, crime, lack of jobs, so there's a lot of things that you could observe and test and see. And this is what sociology really takes off as a science. First, a few general thoughts about the nature of history itself and historiography. It's been through many changing modes and fashions in the last 100-200 years. Hegel and his followers believed that history was determined by a mysterious spirit, and such POSTIC aliens as Oswald Spengler or Toynbee saw periods of history as unfolding like movements in music. First, a few general thoughts about the nature of history itself and historiography. It's been through many changing modes and fashions in the last 100-200 years. Hegel and his followers believed that history was determined by a mysterious spirit, and such POSTIC aliens as Oswald Spengler or Toynbee saw periods of history as unfolding like movements in music. Tesla showed that you could make a luxury electric car for a profit. That got the attention of other luxury car makers also, government regulations from California and other states that promote electric vehicles. Automakers used to respond to these mandates half-heartedly. They'd build what's called a compliance car. Chelsea Sexton, an industry consultant and electric vehicle advocate explains, it is expensive, it's low volume, it's hard to get, it's somehow engineered to be a little bit unattractive in some way very low range, etc, etc.
Tesla showed that you could make a luxury electric car for a profit. That got the attention of other luxury car makers also, government regulations from California and other states that promote electric vehicles. Automakers used to respond to these mandates half-heartedly. They'd build what's called a compliance car. Chelsea Sexton, an industry consultant and electric vehicle advocate explains, it is expensive, it's low volume, it's hard to get, it's somehow engineered to be a little bit unattractive in some way. Very low range, etc., etc.